Thank you so much for the coming to the budget hearing. Um, I'm Councilwoman Deborah Stark, District 3, and I have Ed Zucker with me tonight. We have a process, a procedure. Ed's going to kind of walk you through that. And we want to hear your comments tonight. We have a lot of staff out here that can also help answer questions that you may have. As a matter of fact, depending on the length of this, I'm sure a lot of them would stay afterward to talk to you independently if you have certain issues that are unique just to yourself. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ed. He'll explain what we're going to do. And then we're going to, we have about 11 speakers. We'll call the speakers up. You do have to come up here to speak because we are televising. <laughs> we need to hear you. You get to be on TV, Channel 11. How many of you watch Channel 11? I'm just curious. Good. Okay. There you go. You'll get to see yourself on Channel 11 then. So, okay. I'm going to turn it over to Ed and we'll get started. Thank you, Councilwoman Stark. Very much appreciate it. Uh, my name is Ed Zerker. I'm the city manager. It's a pleasure to be here with you. The councilman demonstrated how you have to use these mics, which is you got to go right, right into, your, uh, into your face with them here. So uh, it's important to do that. Uh, just some housekeeping notes before we get started. I'm going to first ask our, in our interpreter to introduce herself. My name is Maria Garcia. I am interpreter. Uh, soy intérprete y cualquier persona que necesite ayuda uh, por favor, se pone en comunicación conmigo. Gracias. Thank you. So we're going to try something uh, new this year. We got some feedback last year from some folks that they'd like to have a little bit more information about the budget process itself. So we have two uh, presentations to start. Uh, one is a description of the budget process. Then I'll have some uh, information for you about the trial budget, and then we'll go to the trial budget. Uh, as the councilman said, this is being uh, taped for the city's YouTube channel and Channel 11. Uh, we hope you'll pick up a budget tabloid here as you came in that has a lot of explanation that we won't be able to go through uh, in the videos. This is the first of 15 hearings. So you guys are at number one. Congratulations. We have between now and April 17th, there are 15 hearings uh, with tonight being the first. Uh, as the councilman said, if you'd like to speak, we ask you to fill out a speaker card so we know who you are to call your name to, and the order to uh, call you in. I want to also thank our city staff who are here tonight and just ask you to raise your hands. So thank you all for being here. None of them are being paid extra to be here. This is part of their job, and it's important to us to hear what people have to say. So thank you to them. At, at this point, we're going to take about five minutes to look at an informational video. You guys are the first ones to get to see this. This is brand new. Then I'll come back and explain a couple things about our trial budget. We'll hear a little bit about that, and then we'll get to your comments. So I'll ask Stuart to roll the first. Let's talk about the City of Phoenix budget. But wait, wait, wait. Don't go anywhere. We're going to make this quick and interesting. Did you know that last year, 1.5 tons of broccoli were served at Phoenix Senior Centers? And city vehicles like these garbage trucks travel 2.9 million miles. That's equal to 119 times around the earth. Can't forget about our furry friends, the city's trained police and fire dogs. Their job is to sniff out the bad guys and find evidence. Last year, they ate 24,000 pounds of food to stay strong. So what does any of this have to do with the city budget? Everything. The Phoenix budget is around $4 billion and pays for lots of services that make your life better, safer, and more convenient. It's a huge effort made up of lots of smaller pieces, the programs and people that it takes to get the job done. So how those pieces fit together, the people, the buildings, the vehicles, and equipment gets us to the total city budget. Explaining how it works isn't always easy. Managing every item in a budget with over 400 different services provided by over 14,000 employees is a year-round project, one we work on every day. And it's you, the residents of Phoenix, who we have to thank for giving us a budget to balance. The bottom line is that we get revenue, taxes and fees for specific services and grants that we spend on the cost of services. That's city employees, buildings, equipment, contracts, and supplies. Here's how we get revenue to pay for important city services. 
For example, when you eat at a restaurant, shop in a store, fill up the tank, fly out of Sky Harbor, or pay your property taxes or your water and trash bill. That all helps to pay for things like fire and police, paving roads, new bike lanes, more library books, street lights, clean water, parks and trails, just to name a few. To provide these important services, we divide our work and track our costs through 36 city departments and functions like police, fire, parks, libraries, neighborhood services, water and aviation, and our support services like the city clerk, human resources, finance, budget, and information technology departments. Like clockwork, every spring, departments look at what it takes to provide the services for the year. Did employees leave or did new staff join the team? Are there needed or unplanned building or equipment repairs? What will broccoli cost next year? Are there new projects that need to be considered? Okay, we talked about broccoli. Now let's talk about pie. Every department gets a slice or at least a sliver of the pie. And most departments like police, fire, libraries, parks, neighborhood services, and human services are supported by the general fund. It's a pot of money that comes from these areas. General sales and property taxes, revenue distributed by the state from income, state sales and vehicle taxes, and some fines and fees. The general fund is a little less than a third of the entire budget because it pays for services that everyone needs like public safety, senior and youth programs, neighborhoods and libraries, it's the part that gets the most of the public's attention. Now, check out this slice. It's a little more than a third, and it's called enterprise funds. Think business revenue. This slice is from those departments that only charge the people who use their services directly. For example, airlines and passengers at the airport, conventioneers, water and sewer users, and customers who pay for trash pickup and recycling. And the last slice is called special revenue funds. That's the last third of the budget. This is funding that comes from taxes dedicated for a special purpose. For example, Phoenix Parks and Preserves, Transportation 2050 for Streets and Transit, and the special dedicated sales taxes for police and fire hiring. Now, to get the budget to the next step, first we take a look at what we think it'll cost to provide our services next year looking at salaries and benefits for the employees in each area. That's about 80% of our general fund budget, as well as other costs like replacing equipment and paying for gas, electricity, computers, and supplies. Then we estimate how much revenue we will take in through taxes, fees, and grants. By law, we have to make the revenue and expenses match. That's called a balanced budget. If there's not enough, we ask how to cut back. But if there's more revenue than expenses, we ask how it should be spent. It's the same process for general funds, enterprise funds, and special revenue funds. That asking is called the trial budget. It's a list of proposals from the city manager and staff based on what they have heard from the city council and the community. It's a trial budget because it's not final. It's a starting place to hear from you. The trial budget is discussed with the city council, and then we come to you. Every resident of Phoenix, yes, all 1.6 million of you, are invited to tell us what you think. You can attend a meeting and give your feedback there, or read the trial budget online and give feedback that way. Based on what you tell us, the budget is revised and presented to the city council for a second round of discussion and feedback. And then the final budget is developed and presented for the city council to formally adopt. That means when July 1st rolls around, broccoli can be served and trucks can roll through the city. Departments know how much funding they have. Remember the pie? But they have to live within their means and use only the slice they've been given. What happens next? A new year of work. The budget process for the following year starts and we do it all again. Managing and balancing the budget is a big responsibility, and we are glad to have you be part of it every year. All right, so that's just a little bit of background about the budget. I promise we are not serving broccoli tonight. Uh, if we did, it would be delicious, however. 
So now we want to talk about the 2018-19 trial budget. That's the budget that starts for the year uh, July 1. And the pieces that you saw in here will uh, come into play in this next video presentation that we have. Um, the trial budget is, is the city that I presented as the city manager to the council uh, is balanced. It preserves services. There's a little tiny bit more to add that we want to get your comment on or anything on your mind about the city services uh, as it is uh, as it stands today. And your feedback really helps us out. We have cards. While you're seeing this, if you're inspired and you haven't filled out a speaker card and you'd like to, we'll ask you to do that. And then at the end, we'll give everyone a couple of minutes uh, to weigh in. It, as we said, is recorded on channel 11. We have a minute taker. The minutes are distributed to all the council members so that all council members can see what's said in each district. And again, I want to thank Councilwoman Stark for hosting this first one. And with that, we will roll the video on the specifically on what's in the trial budget, uh, some detail from this pamphlet. And now, the City of Phoenix 2018-2019 trial budget. Last year, we projected a potential budget deficit for 2018-19, more expenses than revenue, as high as $60 million. Thanks to strong leadership from the mayor and city council, we took early action, and now we have a balanced budget. Here's what we did. Last September, the city council voted to reduce overhead expenses. The council also acted on a new state law that allowed us to spread our public safety pension payments over 25 years instead of 20 years. The city also held the line on spending, giving us a surplus fund balance to start the year. And a healthy economy kept revenues on target. All this led to a five-year forecast with our budget in balance. Now the trial budget starts with basically the same pie as last year, continuing our core services. In the general fund and dedicated revenue funds, this includes hiring firefighters and police officers, providing funding for parks, streets, transit, libraries, senior centers, youth services, arts and culture, and neighborhood services. We also have funds to replace aging vehicles, especially police cars and fire equipment, repair buildings and facilities, and keep our computer systems up to date. And with some of the savings from last year, we funded a police and fire pension reserve fund to help pay any unexpected future changes in their pension costs. The trial budget includes $2.7 million in proposed enterprise and special revenue fund additions to keep pace with growth and workload demands, as well as $2.9 million in additional general funds to allocate for community services. The general fund provides support for basic services across the city, like police and fire staffing, park and library operations, and programs for youth and seniors. Let's walk through each area. First, the general fund. Public safety has the highest priority in our budget, with over 70% of our general fund going to police, fire, prosecutors, court system, and emergency management. In the trial budget, the proposal is speed up processing of the more than 77,000 police public records requests received each year by reallocating current resources. In addition, the police department will add resources for crime scene investigation. Adding five new positions will help officers locate and apprehend violent offenders possessing guns. The addition of eight fire protection positions to support the city's building inspection program and ensure properties throughout the city comply with fire safety laws and standards. And we're budgeted to continue hiring police officers and firefighters. The trial budget includes a $6 million general fund set aside and related grant support to keep fires filled staffing level at 1,654 positions for the next three years. Reducing the impacts of homelessness in Phoenix is a priority. With a nearly 60% increase in unsheltered homeless, the goal of the city is lead with services by connecting individuals experiencing homelessness with appropriate services while reducing the impact on Phoenix neighborhoods. The PHX CARES Community Action Response Engagement Services Initiative saw more than 1,000 calls for outreach and engagement in the first three months. 
As part of the new PHX CARES initiative, the proposed budget provides for additions across human services, neighborhood services, and parks and recreation, including the addition of two more contracted homeless outreach teams to increase the city's caseload capacity by 360 clients per year and continuing to lead with services. Parks and Recreation will add two ranger positions to provide direct outreach to people needing services in the city's urban park system. This brings our total number of rangers to 79, adding two positions to coordinate client service referrals, improve response times, and ensure coordination of efforts by all city departments to address code violations that arise from encampments. Phoenix continues its investment in neighborhood livability in this year's proposed budget with these proposed additions. Add five enforcement staff in the Neighborhood Services Department for a new Sober Living Home Licensing Program. The purpose of this program is to enhance the health, safety, and welfare of residents of structured sober living homes and the surrounding community by establishing standards and regulations for the homes and their operators. As part of program administration, the City Clerk Department also will add two licensing positions to process and oversee applications funded through licensing fees. Increasing shade and replacing trees citywide with $450,000 to plant 750 trees annually and provide water and maintenance for them to thrive. This is also part of the City's Tree and Shade Master Plan. Additionally, the Office of Arts and Culture is proposed to receive an additional $30,000 in funds to increase grant funding for Phoenix Arts and Culture organizations to pre-recession levels. There is also funding for a project manager tasked with developing a Latino cultural center in the city of Phoenix. And for our libraries, continuing to restore hours for the community. This proposal makes Sunday hours permanent at four libraries, Yucca, Century, Harmon, and Acatillo. Lastly, the budget provides for funding to support outreach for the 2020 census to make sure all residents participate and get counted and the staff needed to oversee the city's involvement with the census count. Now for the non-general fund piece of the pie. Remember, this funding comes from dedicated fees and charges to customers, like development fees from companies that must pay for construction-related services provided by the city. The Planning and Development Department will use this revenue to add 18 positions, handling everything from plan review and site inspections to mapping, long-term planning, and more frontline staff for customer service assistance. Additionally, the Street Transportation Department will use special revenue funds to add 30 positions at a cost of $859,000 to improve our streets and support the paving maintenance and traffic improvements as well as traffic signal electricians, transportation 2050 related bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure development and maintenance, and employees to oversee the city's pavement plan, street sweeping, and proper implementation of Americans with Disabilities Act required projects. Altogether, these pieces of the pie do more than describe the work our city departments will do in the coming year. They tell the story of Phoenix's continued growth to be the fifth largest city in the country with a diverse and thriving economy and a community that's in demand as a great place to live, work, and play. Thanks for taking the time to learn about the 2018-19 City of Phoenix trial budget. And please don't forget, this year's budget hasn't been adopted just yet. Your input is important, and the City of Phoenix wants to hear from you on what the upcoming budget should look like. Make sure you pick up a budget pamphlet outlining all the proposals and options at any of the public meetings or online at phoenix.gov budget. You can also send your comments or questions to budget.research at phoenix.gov or to reach us by phone, call 602 262 4800. You can also comment on social media by using hashtag Phoenix Budget. Thank you for participating in this important process.
All right, now let's hear from you, and we'll ask you to take a, just two minutes, no more than two minutes. We've got almost 20 speakers. Uh, the councilman will call your name, and uh, I'll let you know when we get towards the end of your time. So, Winifred Green. Ms. Green? She's going to be followed by Craig Kipkin, so former councilman Kipkin. <laughs> I'm Winifred Green, own property on Cave Creek Road, 10012 North Cave Creek Road, known as the Antique Outpost. There is a wash behind our business. And uh, thank goodness to the bike squad, they pulled one guy out of there with four felony wants on him. They had a mess down there of camping and in a beautiful secluded place that they had. Uh, I was told Phoenix Cares would do something to help me. Well, they did. They sure did. After I had already made arrangements to have the wash cleaned out, to the tune of about $4,000. Uh, I got a, in the day they were starting the work, uh, I got a notice that I was uh, cited by the city of Phoenix and there was somebody was going to come out and tell me which, why, and how. And uh, since I've worked with the city of Phoenix for many, many years, I took that a little bit hard. Uh, oh, to go back on the Saturday night before these people that were in the wash set three trees on fire. So the fire department came out. Now, I cannot see where Phoenix Cares did a thing for that situation. Um, I was to meet with a, some lady on a Wednesday. I did not see her. I was at the business, but I did not see her. If she was there, she didn't introduce herself. Um, so it was a bike squad our Desert Horizon police, and an individual cleaned the wash there. Now, when the city cleans the wash where the city is, we use city help, city employees, that I think we all pay their salary somehow. But when an individual has to clean that wash, they have to clean it on their own to get those people out of there. Uh, First Christian Church, uh, the church I attend, hel helps desert schools uh, in uh, mountain uh, uh, school. They have given up on helping the people in the wash, it, kind of regrouping to get more help, different help. Why can't churches like that, people like that, have the opportunity to go in to help people who want help. But now these people that were in the wash behind my business, uh, they don't want help. All they want to do is move on up the wash and cause the police more problems up above. In fact, that's how I got the uh, bike squad. They went up Cave Creek Road to another situation, and when they came back down, I stopped them, got them to go down to the wash and look at it the first time. Then they came back again, and that's when they pulled the one fella out. So, you know, it, it's a growing thing. The people in Tapatio, uh, there are constantly being robbed and, and people just squatting on them. And so what are we going to do? Thank I, you. I do think the police and the fire department need more. And I know they're getting more, but they need more. Thank you. And we do love our bike squad down in Desert Horizon. I like it so much, Ed. I think we should have in other parts of the city, but that's for another discussion. So, Craig, thank you very much, Wilbur. And Craig is followed by John Seifert. I work for Central Arizona Shelter Services. The, uh, the main homeless shelter downtown. And I guess I'd like to start saying about homelessness. Oh, thank you. 
uh, I'd like to start saying about homelessness, you know, it's bad for the individual to be on the street. It's bad for their neighborhoods for people to be on the street. It's bad for the community for people to be on the street. That's just plain and simple. Uh, I applaud the city for the outreach program. Let me set the table quickly a second. We have actually three times as many unsheltered homeless people on the street as we did seven years ago today. Um, that's, a, that's a big number. That's a lot of people. And everybody sees it. Everybody out here knows that and everybody sees it. And it's really clear. Uh, I applaud this. this uh, well, I'll make it simple. There's three things that we need to do. One is the outreach program is an exciting program. It's a creative program. It's a well-funded program. It's a program that, that will bring in people. We don't have beds for those people. Um, we just plain don't have beds. We're full every night. We've got 470 beds. <coughs> Salt Lake City's homeless shelter has 1,200 beds in a city a third the size of Phoenix. So I, much, as, much as people don't want to see more beds, we need more beds. We've got to get ser more services, by the way. The number three to do, outreach, shelter. Number three is sooner or later we're going to have to address affordable housing in this city. That is an absolute imperative, and if we don't do it five years from now, we're going to say, what were we thinking? Why did we let this happen? But back to shelter a second, just to cover real quickly a few points. CAS right now is the caseworker, case management relation, uh, re ratio to clients of 47 to 1. The nationally accepted standard is 30 to 1. If we can lower, if we can increase our case managers, we can lower the length of stay that people have. Um, we can only case manage 35% of the people, not of the people we see. We see 5,000 unduplicated people in a year, but we can only case manage a third of the people who actually qualify for case management. So we're not even, we're not even getting to those 5,000. We qualify people based on their acuity, how, how possible it is to help them, how impossible it is to help them. We can only get to 35% of those people. Uh, we don't have a place to put outreach people as they come in. I see you looking at your watch. I'm, I'm, I'm racing along. Uh, and uh, we can, well, more caseworkers, we can reduce the length of stay. That means we have to build less best beds, hopefully. If we can reduce the length of stay, that wants to happen. If you want to get homeless people out of your neighborhood, get them a bed at CAS, because we have an 85% positive outcome for people who do get paid case managed. 85% of the people we case manage have a positive outcome within a year. Thank you. John's going to be followed by Candace. I'm John Seifert. I live at 12640 North 2nd Street. I've been there about 18 years, but I've lived in Phoenix for about 40 years. Um, I want to tell most everyone here, I used to work for the City of Phoenix and Street Transportation Department, so I want to speak to issues with streets. So probably everyone here um, on their way here and probably on their way back is going to use the streets in some way. They're going to probably drive on it. They're going to walk on it either do that a couple times a day. So I want to remind everyone that we have, um, there's about 1.6 million people. So if they all go to work or if they all go to school every day and they drive five or 10 miles, that's about 50, 60 million miles a day that is wear and tear on our streets today. So if you haven't been uh, paying attention, some of our streets kind of worn out, but there's been some progress in the last couple of years that I've been observing some of the illuminated signs uh, you know, that at the major, major intersections are getting replaced. It's much better for all of us. You can see them well at night, and, and that's something that Phoenix has always pride to, been proud to do is make it easier for drivers to find their way around. But um, just as important as that is to uh, continue to add asphalt and repave the streets to make sure that it's, you know, we can all go there with the streets being in pretty good condition, that there's not too many potholes so that when Phoenix and fire need to respond to you, that they can get to your house quickly and safely. So, so I'm just a proponent of, you know, keep maintaining our streets, keep moving forward with it. And one other thing, um, we all have street lights. Um, I think the last time I was aware of there were about 100,000 street lights. Phoenix is doing something uh, pretty creative. They're converting them to LEDs. And at one time that budget used to be like $10 million for electricity. So whenever that gets done, it's going to take a number of years. That budget's probably going to go down to about two or three million dollars. So that's a huge saving to the citizens and the taxpayers of Phoenix. So with that, I want to say thanks to uh, Councilman or Councilwoman Deb and the City Manager Ed for all the work that they've been doing. Thanks, John. Now, Candace, followed by Miranda. I'm going to butcher your last name. 
through. Thank you, Councilwoman Deb Stark. We appreciate all you do for our district and throughout the city of Phoenix. We've had conversations on other issues. I'm here tonight to speak specifically for public safety. I volunteer and am the current chair for the Black Mountain Community Alliance. I am also on the 301 Block Watch Grant Oversight Committee. So I see some numbers and a different perspective than a lot of citizens do. What concerns me very honestly is we're hearing the numbers coming out of general fund that are dedicated to fire, public safety, police. But what I'm concerned with is the monies that are reappropriated. And I am by no means an economist, I don't understand this, but there was over $128 million reappropriated in the 1718 budget for public safety. Those are dedicated funds from three specific ordinances that were passed by the voters, G3696, S31877, and G4987. This information is easily available on the city's website. I just Googled for public safety finance. My concern with the oversight committee and the block watch grants, we have had Jill Salea, who is the director for, public, uh, for the fiscal management. She has attempted to redirect funds of over $500,000 to pay salaries for fiscal. Um, there is over $350,000 applied for out of the neighborhood block watch grants that is looking to fund different things that, in my opinion, should be coming out of these public safety dedicated funds, whether it's wake up clubs and involving our youth in crime prevention programs, funding our precincts so that they're not needing to go to this. Um, they are having to partner with neighborhoods just to write a grant as a straw person. Um, the citywide graffiti hotline, citywide block watch, neighborhood patrol. There's a lot of things in the department. We lost our community programs coordinators. How do we be better eyes and ears and partner with our public safety if we don't have the resources in our precinct to support us? Another one is, um, you know, fire, what is it, engine 55? nine minute response time. I understand that there was some delays and some you know, posturing on that one. But in my opinion, if there has been monies, and I mean, I'm going back to the 15, 16 budget of over $32 million that was reappropriated. So the money has been reappropriated. There's millions of dollars and I've only gone back to 2013, 14. So my question is this allocated money, where is it and why aren't we getting more services to the communities that can support these programs? Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for everything you do. We really appreciate all the work you do for Black Mountain Precinct. And then Miranda followed by Casey Whitehead. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Miranda. I work down at the Andre House of Hospitality. It's a house of hospitality for folks experiencing homelessness right across the street from CAS, the shelter services. Um, I wanna talk today specifically about um, sanitation down in that area. Um, anyone that's been down to that area will know it is, it's inhumane, it's despicable. The conditions that we're allowing our brothers and sisters to live in down on that corner um, of the city. Uh, I moved here very recently, but many of the folks that come through Andre House to volunteer have no idea how bad it is down there until they're able to get down there themselves and see what's going on. Um, the services provided, um, we only have the capacity to keep restrooms open till 7 p.m. After 7 p.m., anyone who is unsheltered for that night, which is over 200 people on any given night, do not have a place to use the restroom. Um, they're not, they often face discrimination for going in public places, maybe at McDonald's or a coffee shop. They would not let someone who appears to be experiencing homelessness in to use the restroom. There are some people that are unable to care for themselves that um, don't have access to public bathrooms. Sanitation is a human right, uh, and the people down there deserve more than what we're, we're giving them right now. Um, the resources, um, people are able to get shelter, uh, maybe in CAS or in the overflow shelter. From what I understand, the overflow shelter is closing down, and then we're going to have even more folks sleeping out on the street. Um, well, these shelters, are able to you know, shelter some people on any given night. There are folks that are unable to get into the shelter for a variety of different reasons, and then their only option is to, to go to the bathroom on the street. Um, and it's, 
it's disgusting that that is the condition down there. I would love for the city uh, to give more funding for some kind of center, navigation center. I know Seattle has something like a navigation center, something like that, where people have access to restrooms 24-7. Uh, again, we really can't. Um, I, I encourage you, um, council women, council, city manager, all the, the local <laughs> folks to come down and see the conditions down on, on the street and see um, what we're leaving our brothers and sisters. And it's, again, it's, it's really disturbing and every human deserves better than what they're given down there. Thank you. I'm all familiar with what they've done in Denver as far as sanitation. Lindsay and then saw, uh, no, Casey saw by Lindsay, sorry. Maya. Hello everyone. My name is Casey and I am a coworker of Miranda's and we work at the Andre House of Hospitality. As she said, we work with people experiencing homelessness and I would like to talk for the Phoenix Cares Initiative. I have many experiences with this initiative in the sense that I understood when it came out a few months ago that it's supposed to um, be a team of people that come and see um, our guests, whether they be um, in downtown or they'd be anywhere else. I know um, Ms. Green, you said in your area and people are supposed to be receiving services and being shown where they can be sheltered, where they can get resources, where they can get a public restroom and where they can provide these basic human rights that everyone deserves. Um, so in this initiative, you're allowed to call or you're allowed to send an email. I sent many emails. Um, one a day for three weeks straight, talking about the conditions around Andre House, specifically the zone. The zone is the areas between 8th Avenue and 15th Avenue, especially around Madison, Jackson, and um, these are the areas that the city doesn't really see. So in these videos, as I'm watching, it's showing the downtown, everyone's looking nice, and yes, the downtown looks very kind, but you go a few blocks away from the government buildings, and these are people who, 2.40 a night, Cass did a survey, are sleeping on the street. It's cold, now it's hot, and people are tired, people are sweaty, people need shelter. And when the Phoenix Cares Initiative comes, they have sent an email to our director, Father Tom. They have stated that they are gonna stop coming. They have stopped coming the past at least three months to Jackson Street between 9th Avenue and 11th Avenue. Isn't that crazy? These are the people who are the most vulnerable in the Phoenix area who are not receiving these services. Phoenix Cares says we're only going to care about people who are ready to be in a house just like that. But we need people to, we need more, I don't know necessarily what we need in the sense of like Phoenix Cares wants more money as this proposed budget. budget. I'm proposing that does not happen in this manner because people are not receiving services. The chronically homeless are not receiving services. They are being overlooked. They're not being looked at. They are being ignored. No one is paying attention to people who need the most help. And that's exactly why. They cost a lot of money. But you know what? Every person matters, no matter what. Um, also, something I noticed in the video, it said, um, with the increase in Phoenix Cares money, um, this would be an increase in response times. Um, I am supporting that the, this will not help. Increased response time for who? And the increased response time will not help those who are, who I just said, who are chronically homeless. We need more. Thank you. Lindsay's followed by Aaron Clapp. Hello everyone, um, my name is Lindsay Myers. Um, I also work at Andre House of Hospitality. I have for the last two years. Before that, I was a Jesuit volunteer at Central Arizona Shelter Services. So I both worked in case management and now in um, providing ba basic needs for people experiencing homelessness. Um, like Casey said, um, there is a big question about this Phoenix Cares Initiative and what exactly it's going to do to help our chronically homeless um, individuals. Um, my big question is, um, Phoenix Cares Initiative is doing outreach to those experiencing homelessness, and it should. Um, but once you do outreach to people experiencing homelessness, you are bringing them to the Human Services Campus, where CAS is located, and you're bringing them to Andre House. Um, 
when you bring them there, um, we need to start asking questions about, do we have the capacity to care for all of these people that are coming to us? Um, do we have enough shelter? Um, do we have enough case management? Um, we don't. Um, like, what's your name? I'm sorry. Craig. Yes, like Craig said, he didn't work there when I worked there, but um, we do not have enough services. Um, specifically, um, housing. So, um, for instance, um, we have all of these individuals who are chronically homeless um, living right now on 8th Avenue in Jackson because the police have pushed them over there. Um, we, they are in tents. Um, a lot of them are very medically vulnerable and cannot even get on the Human Services campus because they have blankets. Um, and if you ha um, have um, certain hygienic needs, they will not let you into the overflow shelter. So that means we have the most vulnerable in our community who are not able to access services. And then we're bringing the even more vulnerable, chronically homeless people into a centralized area between 8th Avenue and 12th Avenue on Jackson. Um, so I just think we need more. Um, we need to think about how they're how are we going to increase capacity for shelter? The overflow shelter is closing in September. We do not have an alternate right now. So we have 240 people in CAS, but then we have 200 people sleeping outside, and then an additional um, 200 people in overflow. So that puts about 440 people sleeping outside on 11th Avenue in Jackson um, with the same exact case management team and the same exact um, housing. So if we are talking about housing, um, because we don't have a lot of affordable housing in Phoenix, we should also consider um, there are chronically homeless programs, permanent supportive housing for people. Um, if you talk to a lot of the case managers at CAS, they will tell you that once people get housing, it's really hard for them to continue to have housing because we do not have enough um, wraparound services for people to continue to go and check on those people because if you are very mentally ill, it is going to be damn hard for you to keep your house. Um, and we also have, um, so it's hard for them to keep their housing, but then um, not only that, what, the, what apartment is going to let these people into their place? Because you talk to any case manager at CAS, they will tell you it takes them a very, very, very long time for apartment complexes to find ones that even take the voucher for permanent supportive housing. So where are we doing? What are we doing for these most vulnerable people in our society and our wonderful community? And I would love for you all to come down and meet them because they're quite wonderful. But also, let's talk about rapid rehousing. So that's also the second housing for people in our area. Um, for people who aren't chronically homeless, who have some, um, like, some situational needs, like they might be on probation or they might have a medical problem, but they're not chronically homeless. Okay, sorry, I'm finishing up. When I worked at CAS, which you guys might know now, um, there were hundreds of people on the waiting list for rapid rehousing. So what I'm saying is, here we are having hundreds of people experiencing homelessness, and we're not thinking further. We're not sheltering them, and we're not thinking further about where to put them. In the long run, people deserve more. I encourage you all to come down and meet them and hear their stories and know the people behind the face of homelessness because they're wonderful. And I'm sorry, it went more than two minutes, but there you go. Okay, hello. Um, my name is Erin and I also work at the Andre House. Um, I would say I'm sorry for taking up more time, but I'm not because this is a very important issue and the people we serve each day deserve so much more. So I'm here um, especially to talk about how the overflow shelter is closing. Um, about 250 people a night are sleeping in the overflow shelter. Um, the plan is to close it on September 1st. That does not, they have not given the people sleeping in there um, a warning that they're closing it yet. They have not um, started to make arrangements for What's going to happen next? There is no alternative shelter. Um, there are already 240 people between uh, 9th and Madison and like 11th and Jackson, and they are sleeping on the streets in encampments and are being ignored. They have not been assisted. They have not been reached out to by Phoenix Cares. Um, so we need to give more assistance to them. But also, we can't add 250 more people on top of that. Um, at Andre House, we. We see people every day who rely on this overflow shelter. 
Um, it is getting hot out. It, um, people will be sleeping on the street in 100 degrees every night. And overflow is the only place right now that um, shields people from the heat and also the violence on the street. Um, they're, they're planning on closing September 1st and they'll be decreasing the beds until all of these people are either housed or back on the street. And the likelihood of getting all of the folks that sleep in overflow housed is very slim. There are these um, medically vulnerable and chronically homeless guests that aren't able to get housing right away. They're not ready. They're not housing ready. And the rapid rehousing program and the Section 8 housing is good for the people who can use it. But uh, many of our guests cannot use it, and there is no place for them to go after September 1st. They are going to start cutting beds April 9th by 50, and that'll be 50 more people who aren't ready to go into a house because they aren't ready to be housed. Um, we need more support for the people who aren't ready to be housed, but we most definitely, um, our short-term solution right now is to create a uh, zero barrier shelter where people can go and sleep and be safe and be comfortable at night because there is no way for even those who are able to get a job and get housing, no one can get a job and get housing and make progress if they aren't sleeping. Like, it's just not possible and people deserve rest and shelter. Um, there are 240 people on the street right now and I do not want to see that number rise to 400 because it not only will be chaos, but it will be more inhumane than the conditions people are living in now. Um, so we need more shelter. We need another shelter. CAS is doing the best they can with what they have, but they do not have enough beds for everyone. We need more shelter. Thank you. Thank you. Anna Ch Chavez, followed by Patrick Hirsch. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Hi, I know, another person from Andre House. I'm sorry. <laughs> There's six of us on course staff. My name's Anna. Um, you've heard a lot of vocabulary from us today. I'm just going to talk really quickly about a word that my friend Aaron just used. It's called people that aren't housing ready. So basically, what, uh, what I'm going to talk about is people that are not, they're mentally unwell, and they're very medically fragile. And, and I'm, sure, I'm sure many of you people in this room know or know someone that has mental illness, and you know as well as I do and as well as we do that, it makes them very hard for them to take care of themselves and to hold down a house, not even mental illness, like developmental disabilities or, or, med or medical conditions. So I'm not going to roll out stats on you. I'm just going to tell you a story really quickly. So I was at Andre House one day, and a guest came in, and I noticed that he had a really low IQ. He had severe, severe, severe cardiomyopathy, and after investigating, I found that, you know, luckily enough, he was covered by Altex, which is Arizona Long-Term Care, and DDD, which is a division of developmental, uh, uh, it's like case management for people who have developmental disabilities. But after investigating and talking to his case managers, it's been, it had been like maybe four months since either have followed up on him. And he wasn't the first case after re researching and researching. There are a lot of them like him out there. So... In addition to the overflow shelter closing up, we need more outreach teams to go and find those people that aren't housing ready, that cannot take care of themselves in, in, by their own in our apartment, and get them connected to the services that are already available, because they don't have the capacity to do so by themselves. And that's wrong. It is wrong that they have to that people that have schizophrenia, that they are bipolar, that have cerebral palsy, have to sleep on the streets because they don't know that there is an agency waiting there to help them. And it is also wrong that the case managers are, are so short-staffed that they cannot follow up on them because that is wrong and people deserve better. Thank you. And following Patrick, oh, yeah, will be Nancy. How's everybody doing? It's so great to see everybody here tonight. They call me half and half at the Andre house. I live across the street at St. Vincent de Paul's. I'm homeless, but I work at the Andre House, too. You know, at 4.30, we all get together outside the Andre House, all of us, and we feed 700 people to 500 people a night. But it's kind of chaos outside when we, we, when we hand everybody a ticket. 
and everybody goes in and hands one of the staff members the ticket when we go in. But you know, we walk down the friends and my friends it's like you're eating with your own family and you're 10 years old again I want everybody here to go to andre.org especially you guys and I want to invite everybody to come down and either volunteer or have a meal with us so you can see the magic we do with our friends and they are our friends I'm really concerned about St. Vincent the Falls closing up not for myself but when I stand out there at 7.30 at night and I wait to get in, I'm concerned about my friend Joe that can't breathe. I'm concerned about my friend Jim that's in a wheelchair. I'm concerned about this other lady that can hardly um, keep her bowels moving that we take care of every day. We have to think about these people. We have to get a plan. But having CARES, I'll be honest with everybody, I've never seen anybody from CARES come there. Maybe they drive by once in a while and wave at us, but they're doing nothing. CARES is wasting the taxpayers' money. They really are. Mother Teresa once said, I ain't no social worker, I get things done. That's what we need to do down there, which we need to start getting things done, we need change. CAS is a great place, it really is, and I talk to these two wonderful people, but they need new showers there. They don't need, cow they don't need case managers, they need showers that work, they need toilets that work. But everybody needs to come down and take a look and see what we're doing. But where are we going to get the money for doing this? They brought it up tonight. We're spending $10 million a year on lighting in Phoenix, Arizona. You know, when I traveled around and I was homeless across the United States, most cities right now are putting motion detectors inside their parking garages. So there's no lights on unless a car goes in. If we just did that and did the LED lights, we could keep a homeless shelter there and we can have a thousand beds like they're asking for. But we gotta stop saying we don't have funding, we don't have this, we can't do that. We need to get action. We really need to help our friends. And I really hope everybody can come down and volunteer and see my friends down there. Because we do magical things every day. We don't have any judgment, no expectation, we just serve. And I think when we all get up in the morning, we all pick up something we have to do for our God we at the Andre House, we get up and serve. And I really appreciate everybody listening to me. Everybody have a good night. Thank you. Just want to make a, a comment just in context. So Phoenix Cares is several things. One, it coordinates services within the city so that police and sanitation and neighborhood services are all coordinated internal that people don't have to call five different places to get something. It also is citywide. So while you may not see them every day, down uh, Jackson, they're covering 500 square miles in the city. And clearly we don't have enough uh, Phoenix Cares outreach teams. That's why we're adding some to it. I also want to just talk about the overflow shelter. The overflow shelter, the, the city of Phoenix funds, uh, partially funds CAS, and we also fund the United Methodist Outreach Ministries for women and families. The city of Phoenix does not fund the overflow shelter. That is funded by DES, the state, by the county, and by United Way. And so there's a division of who's funding what amongst all the governments. So I just won't, don't want to leave the impression that it's only the city doing things. This is spread across the city, the county, the state. United Way is, is pitching in. And Andre House is doing more than, more than yeoman's work in, in, in their share there. But I don't want to leave the impression that somehow Phoenix Cares is not doing anything. It's over 500 square miles of the city. Uh, all over the place. So thank you for that. Thank you. So Nancy Tony, you're next. You want to speak still? I'm Nancy Creening. I live in Moon Valley. And I'm very grateful to you all for your service. Um, I'm here to ask about a community policing oversight and review committee. I've been studying this issue and given the situation in Sacramento and other cities um, and right here in Phoenix too, um, I feel there's too much shooting going on and um, I, I've been listening to the people here and talk about mental illness and 
in almost every case, it seems to me that these shootings are happening because of mental illness and because of people who are not getting the services that they need. And um, I know I have mental illness in my own family and there was a suicide and there have been other things. Um, and it's, it's just a really <laughs> big, big problem that is societal. But it also involves the police and my heart goes out to the police who, who are engaged in, with people who have these problems. And so having an oversight committee and funding for it would really, I think, be a good thing that would help bring focus to all the different aspects of these tragedies. So thank you. Thank you. So, Lynn Ling Lee, Miss Lee, how are you? And you are followed by Judy, it's the Arts and Culture Group. Good evening, everyone. Honorable Councilwoman Deborah Stuck, I'm Lining Lee. Thank you for having Budget Hearing tonight. I live in Phoenix District 3 since 1988, and I'm very proud to be in Councilwoman Deborah Stuck's district. I'm speaking today as Commissioner of Phoenix Office of Arts and Culture, also a proud resident of District 3. Arts and culture are very important. Arts and culture not make our life beautiful, also can bring us all together with peace, harmony, understanding, appreciation, and unity. Arts and culture also can educate our younger generations to become leaders of tomorrow. Arts and culture also bring business for Phoenix and provide economic impact for more than $400 million, increase job opportunity and support local businesses. Therefore, arts and culture not only enrich Phoenix, also provide impact for the economy. For this important reason, I hope City of Phoenix do not cut budget for arts and culture. I also like to sincerely thank Councilwoman Deborah Stark and Mayor Greg Stanton for your continuous strong support for arts and culture. I thank you very much for your attention. I also like to use one minute to make a comment for the issues our sisters and brothers to bring up. I believe the homeless people, when I <clears throat> heard their story, I feel uncomfortable. I feel broken heart. Uh, because everyone deserves a good life. I think the homeless issue is not only city of Phoenix issue, it's all our residents issue. We should all work together and make a strong power uh, to support and help city of Phoenix to resolve and re to improve this problem. I suggest the city of Phoenix can outreach to the communities and also uh, set up a, just like adoption. I, I saw our street has adoption and then if we can have an adoption program so we can unite all our citizens together and then uh, no matter we can get a money or we can get a, uh, services uh, together and then together we can make this problem improve and also resolve this problem. Thank you. Thank you. So Judy? Yes. Judy's also on Arts Commission. Uh, 
I'm embarrassed, but I'm going to read this because <laughs> if I forget something, it'll haunt me. <laughs> I'm Judy Giles, and I am um, on the board of Friends of Phoenix Public Art. Thank you so much, Deb, for all of your support, and Mr. Duker. Um, the positive ways the arts help to improve the quality of life in our city are many. The arts make the city a more vibrant and exciting place to live and work. There are many public art installations in every council district. And in fact, Council District 3 has 19 public art projects and 12 arts and culture organizations. My favorite projects in the district are the Grasshopper Bridge in Moon Valley Park, which is both functional and whimsical, and the Nisbet Road Bridge on the 51 Freeway, which mimics the mountains in the area. It is important to note that in the proposed budget, funds have not increased for public art maintenance of our over 190 fixed projects, which is a desperate need for our community so that arts installations, which are many times tied to improvements in streets, transit, and other necessary services, remain safe and showcase our city to its best. And of course, you paid for them. The maintenance this budget item also pays for is the city's over 1,000 piece municipal art collection. We truly appreciate the current level of support in the trial budget. However, we would like to request that 16,000 more dollars be added to the maintenance line item. This would bring the total up to $100,000 which is the minimum necessary to take care of the annual prioritized needs of our city's public art. And again, you paid for it. It is imperative to include $100,000 for public art maintenance in the 2018 budget in order that we can continue to protect the city's investment in its public art. The Friends of Phoenix Public Art is a young nonprofit which focuses on assisting the Office of Arts and Culture as well as the City of Phoenix in providing maintenance and, conser and conservation funds for our city's nationally recognized treasures. It also has provided funding to mount the exhibits in the gallery at City Hall as well as enlisting volunteers to keep the gallery open for the past six years. <laughs> And I bet some of you didn't know that there's a gallery in City Hall where we show exhibits um, of the fantastic art collection that Phoenix has amassed over a hundred years. So I appreciate everything that the city has done and I am asking Ed for $15,000 more. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Marshall Zebel. Am I pronouncing that correctly, Marshall? Yes. I do put your names, I apologize. Followed by Eric O'Hare. All right, my name is Marshall Zebel, and I'm here um, talking tonight about our budget for our PFD resources and Phoenix Fire Department resources. Um, Again, my name is Marshall Zubo. I'm going I'm to read some of this just so I don't butcher it. So, uh, I'm a Phoenix Fire Department member. I've been a member for now 13 years. Uh, I actually served in one of the companies that's within your district, Engine 33, Fire Station 33, for about eight years, which I'm very proud of. But they are one of the busiest fire stations that, around these areas. Um, so, I demand a better plan for fire, fire department staffing. Um, from our city leaders to increase our fire department staffing and funding. Right now, the staffing level puts our citizens and firefighters at risk, and I'll explain that. So if I could, real quick, everybody kind of take a look at your clock. I'm going to go over time, and I, I apologize now. 
Take a look at your clock. I've got mine here. Um, I've got it ready to go, I promise. So I've got mine here. What I want to do is think about the amount of time that we have and how long it actually takes for a fire truck to show up on scene. And that's what we're going to take a look at here. So I've got this. I'm going to step in here. So um, with our response times and how busy we are as a fire department, I want you to keep that in mind. The staffing level puts our citizens and firefighters at risk. The budget designed to survive the 2010 de uh, deficit has created a dangerous a scenario for us because we're operating at a minimum level. The safe staffing level is 1 to 1,000 citizens within our um, recognized by NFPA, our national fire standard, 1 to 1,000, fire, one firefighter to 1,000 citizens. Right now, currently, City of Phoenix is 1 to 4.5, one firefighter to 4.5 citizens within our staffing level. And that is unacceptable. Our citizens are not covered, you guys are not covered, and I am not covered within our community at our staffing levels. So first do, uh, I want to explain a first do. In our fire stations, we each have an area that we cover, and it's an area of, of the city that we can get to within four uh, minutes or less. Each company is required to be in those areas and cover that area within four minutes or less, and that's our goal. Um, we are not meeting that because of how busy we are and how many calls we are running over these times. So what happens with our first due explanation, or our first due, and let me explain this to you. So when one fire company goes out on an emergency, it's forcing another uh, fire department apparatus to come into that district into our due to talk to basically cover our area Okay, so now our response times instead of being at four minutes. They're getting closer to about six seven eight minutes Response times. Okay, so what we're at right now is um, Excuse me But what we're at right now is we are bordered to one of the busiest districts within our northern district. So we're district three in this area. District two is just north of us. So what happens is when that district has fire department function or a, a, um, a call in that area, what happens is we as a district in this district, district seven, or engine seven, um, engine 33, or any of those engines around this area go up and respond in that area, in that portion of the city to cover their first two. So we are understaffed. We are basically, um, we are understaffed. The district, the border to the north is, is causing our district and our fire station to absorb that area. Okay, and we're, we're basically fighting um, to serve our first two, serve our areas, but to the point to which we don't have any other fire trucks to do that with, and our response times are continuing to go up. So, um, in this district alone, three out of nine of the three out of nine of our engine companies do not meet that standard of four minutes or less response time. Eight out of nine um, of this district's companies run over three thousand calls a year. Over three thousand is is considered very high call volume. Fire engine seven, twenty-seven, and thirty-three all all run over four thousand calls a year, um, which is absolutely. It's so busy, it's 15 calls is about our average of shift. And that's very busy for us. And that takes us away from the emergencies that we're able to run around and get to quickly. So what we would like um, is to increase our number of fire personnel, increase that. We're down right now 138 firefighters. We have increased our call volume up to 50,000 calls this year. Um, down up from 2010 because of our call volume being so high um, everything over 3,000 calls a year is considered very high a company continues to run those calls and it's not getting it's not letting up for us so what I would like to say is I've taken a lot of time and I apologize and I kind of stumbled through that I'm nervous but that was four minutes of, of me talking okay so now imagine if you as a citizen or me as a citizen called the fire department and nobody was there to respond to us for four minutes or longer. Okay, after four minutes, after four minutes on a medical call without oxygen, your brain starts to die. Okay, without 
water on a fire, a fire starts to grow. Every 30 seconds, it doubles in size. So what's going to happen is those response centers, because we are so busy and we are understaffed, 138 firefighters, what's going to happen is those call volumes are going to continue to go up. The staffing is down low. We need to hire more firefighters, and we need to readjust our budget to take care of our firefighters and adjust our public safety staffing. Thank you, Marsha. Okay? Thank you. I appreciate it. You actually went six minutes, so oh. you, proved to, you proved to us that you still wouldn't be there. Thank you. So, Eric. O'Hara. Welcome. That might be a little tall even for me, but it'll work. Um, first and foremost, I apologize in advance. I'm not a public speaker. Like Marshall, I, I, I wear a helmet to work. Um, I work at a different fire station for a different city. I'm passionate about District 3 because I live here. My wife obviously lives here with me. My in-laws live here, my sister-in-law, my nieces and nephew. I have an aunt and uncle who live in this district as well. I'm coming as a firefighter to talk to you, but more specifically as one of your fellow citizens that live in this district. I've got some concerns when it comes to public safety in general, both police officers and fire. I'll start with the police. Chief Williams came and spoke at Coffee at a Cop not too long ago. I was at that district meeting. She talked about how they have the budget for the police officers they need, but they do not have the budget or the support to get the people in the door. It's a very hard process to become a police officer. A lot of background checks, a lot of things. A lot of people apply, very few make through the process. She's talked about needing a nationwide search to find police officers, but she wasn't able to ever get the budget she needed for that. So I'm asking you, sir, if you can take a look at that and see if we can do some sort of nationwide search and look for... We are. She has the budget for it. Perfect. And that's great news to hear. Thank you. The second side of it is the kind of tag on what Marshall talked about. I work at a fire station in a different city. Where police and fire are different, you might notice in the city of Phoenix, you'll see fire trucks that do not say Phoenix on the side. City of Phoenix runs what's called automatic aid, which is when you call 911, you get the closest fire truck to you, whether it's Phoenix, Glendale, Tempe, Chandler, any of the surrounding areas. Sounds great, sounds good, and that's an awesome program. And, and the firefighters, I know, um, my brothers and sisters across the border, we support each other. It really came to light to me how busy this area was when my fire station that's about 16 miles away was the first due, the closest unit to a call that happened up here in Moon Valley, which is over by my house. And it took us 13 minutes to get there, and it was an actual medical emergency where they needed us in the four-minute response time. Marsha went over some numbers. I did some tracking of my own as well. In our district, we have five fire stations. Station 7, Station 20, Station 27, Station 33, and Station 35. Station 33 was so busy, as Marshall talked about, when they hit their 4,000 number, they have a second unit there known as Ladder 33 to go along with Engine 33. They're still both running well over 300 calls or 3,000 calls a year. Station 35 had the same issue, which is just up the road here on 7th Street. They had to introduce station, uh, engine 935. They're both running over 4,000 calls a year. Station 7 just south of here, 4,000 calls a year. What does that mean to you? That roughly means if you do the math, they're averaging 10 calls a day, which doesn't sound like a whole lot, but our calls take anywhere from an hour to two and a half hours to six hours, depending if it's a fire, medical emergency, or what have you. Big calls call for more units. Not too long ago, most of you do not know, there's a station up north where they don't have a station for them, so they're running part-time out of a hotel. Why does that matter? At 7.30 at night, when they shut down the engine because of the lack of funds and lack of the city providing those funds, there was no fire station up there. No engine, no nothing. Nine o'clock at night, a call kicks out for a house fire. Closest unit, driving it at nine o'clock at night in light traffic, made it there in nine minutes. What does that mean to you? That means all the units from here had to drive up north to help. That means there's a giant hole in this area where if you have a heart attack, you fall, somebody gets injured, God forbid there's a shooting, something of that nature, where there's a medical emergency where you need us now, the firefighters here will not be able to get here fast enough to help you. Marshall touched at it. At four minutes of lack of oxygen, you lose heart tissue that never comes back. You lose brain functions that never come back. And those type of things are serious to us. We're very passionate. You see firefighters get up and speak quite often, 
It's not because we're looking for larger pensions. It's not because we're looking for pay raises or anything like that. It's because you don't take this job unless you care about the community. I don't, I don't work at my fire station in Phoenix, or in Phoenix, I work in Glendale. I run the majority of my calls in Phoenix because I'm right on the border. And I can tell you that we take pride in it, and I'm getting the, uh, I'm over time, but I'm gonna steal 30 seconds and I apologize in advance. Um, I see the commander back there, he needs more help if he's gonna drag me away right now. <laughs> um, so long story short of it, we're not looking for anything to get fancy trucks for us. I know talking to the different Phoenix firefighters and through their leadership, they're not looking for extras. They're not looking for recliners. They're not looking for video game systems. They're looking for the manpower and the help to take care of the citizens. And I encourage you to go on Facebook, look at the different firefighter sites that we have set up through the local 493, which is the firefighter union, and ask questions. And if you have any questions, I'll be here. You can shoot them at me. But more importantly, last thing, and then I'll be quiet and I apologize for the fifth time. When you look at the extra funding they're giving the fire department, what does that mean to you? They're non-sworn. What does non-sworn mean? That means that they don't run calls. So in a time of great need, some emergency happens, they're not qualified. They do not go through the academy. They do not get the training we receive. And they pulled qualified candidates out of there. And now they're replacing them with non-sworn so they can't help us in the field. So really, more than anything, it's just office jobs that they're filling on the firefighter budget. So I just ask that you stay engaged in your neighborhood and that if you have any questions and you see the firefighters at the uh, Fries or Safeway getting food, go up, talk to them, ask them how their day is, see what's going on, because we'll always be honest with you because we actually care about you guys. And I apologize for going 47 minutes, but I'm kind of passionate and I'm the biggest one in the room, so I can. Thank you. We know you are, Eric. Uh, Renee Blaine. I'm bringing this a little more local here to North Mountain. We recently had a parking lot closure. There's construction on North Mountain Tower Road. And I'm here to speak for the many special needs people who use that trail. We have older folks taking care of their spouses who need a paved surface. And I've seen them up there. I've seen young moms and strollers, and they need access to that trail. And we were talking about this a few months ago, improving the road from North Mountain to replace the parking lot access. And that's what I'm here to speak for, some road improvement here on 7th Street to make it safer for the bikers and the hikers. Thank you. Thank you. Barbara Snyder. Hi, Barbara. Hello. Um, I just want to say I'm so proud to be part of the city of Phoenix. I'm really proud to be, uh, be here. Um, my family moved here in 1971, and I moved to District 3 um, five and a half years ago, and I really love this district. And I didn't coordinate with the last person who spoke, but uh, Councilwoman Stark knows I'm a big fan of people who have uh, disabilities to be able to have access to North Mountain. But that's not why I'm here today. Um, um, I really agree with that, but I'm, I'm here because I am um, a commissioner on the Arts Commission, Arts and Culture Commission, and I'm also on the and what happened when I moved to this community is I have really discovered a part of the city I really wasn't aware of, which are really hardworking people who do a lot to defend and maintain the community they live in. And, you know, I'm such a fan of that. Our community is engaged. Um, I live near 3rd Avenue and Butler, and um, there aren't really any boundaries in District 3. Everyone's trying so hard. And on behalf of the Arts and Culture Commission, as a commissioner really strongly that the public arts projects that have been created over time really need to have a plan for maintenance and the budget the there is an extra money in the budget to do that so I was really pleased to see that there's money this year to support all the trees for transportation 
And that, that goes a long way because a lot of the arts project incorporate trees. So that's really positive. But there are so many projects in this district that have been built with taxpayer money that haven't been maintained that I feel like all of us in this district work very hard, and our councilwoman and our city manager as well, that I think we have to fund our asset, you know, the maintenance of our assets. So um, I think that's why I wanted to say is that for our community, for uh, actually planning, for economic development and building, we're just, we just can't continue to let those projects decay. So I just want to thank you for the work you're doing. I know that you also agree with this. So I'd just like to help support whatever plans there are to move forward on you know, finding ways to maintain the public art um, that's already been installed and that we want to maintain here in our community. So thank you. Thank you. And I don't know if Claire is still here, but uh, maybe you can get with them. There is a paved trail. It may not as be as steep as the one that goes up to the tower, but it is paved and it is available for people with yes, disabilities. There's an interior shorter trail in the park itself. Um, it's totally ADA accessible, plus right now I think a lot of folks are using the core of the perimeter of the road itself. And it is marked. Okay, thank you. Just to let you know, there are some alternatives why that road is being constructed or reconstructed. Steve Berline. Hi, Deb. Thank you. Hi, my name is Steve Berline. I'm a captain with the Phoenix Fire Department, so you got to hear a couple more minutes of the uh, fire department issues. But real quick, I, I'd like to recognize, first of all, Deb Stark, what an outstanding job uh, as a councilwoman in this district. Not many know, but uh, as the interim, she, be she began to secure a piece of property on 7th Avenue in Glendale. It's probably strategically the most important piece of property in the entire city of Phoenix for the Phoenix Fire Department. That stage 20 that, that sits there, I mean, it can access the mountains. Um, it, we, we just need it so desperately, and the city manager and uh, Deb got that done. So want to recognize you and our uh, our budget director budget and research director Bart Jeff Barton and the sacrifice you're making away from your family tonight and for all the other city of Phoenix staff police officers I just want to say thank you I'm um, captain with the Phoenix Fire Department I also I'm also the president of the United Phoenix Fire Fire Association so uh, great news uh, budgets doing better more money's coming in cities expanding the bad news is we've absolutely outgrown our ability to provide adequate fire and EMS services. Uh, as the uh, firefighters told you already, the North has grown so much, it's constantly pulling resources up there. So when, when those fire stations are built and those fire uh, trucks are put in service, this area will be much better served. The national standards, five minutes and 20 seconds for a response time. City of Phoenix has 65 engines. Six engines meet that response time. City of Phoenix has four lad 14 ladder companies zero of them meet the response time. So it, it's quite simple. 2007, Proposition 1 passed. The citizens of Phoenix uh, decided to raise their taxes a little bit to hire more police officers and firefighters. Then the Great Recession came. It was a darn good thing that that proposition passed before the recession hit because we would have shut fire stations and we would have lost a lot more police officers across the city. But now that things are turning around, um, we have reason to believe the firefighters that the, the prior city manager and fire chief uh, may have supplanted some of that money. And there was language in that initiative that said that the city could not supplant. We need to find out. We need, we need to audit Prop 1 and make sure that money is where it's supposed to be. Um, I feel with some of this surplus, I, I feel strongly that it probably belongs Prop 1 and, and much of that revenue belongs to the fire department which should be used to, to add additional resources, which are desperately needed. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Patrick McMullen, talk about the preserves where actually our firefighters end up at a lot. Not because of you, Patrick. <laughs> uh, thank you. Yes, uh, my name is Patrick McMullen. Um, just live uh, locally here over in Moon Valley. Um, actually below the tower of Shaw Butte. My, my wife and I and our friends, we come here all the time. I'm uh, the president of the Phoenix Mountain Preservation Council, which was started in 1975. 
one of the reasons was to support uh, Barry Goldwater and the creation of the preserves, the desert preserves in this valley, which, which uh, thank you, uh, to, you know, to support uh, Barry Goldwater and the creation of the desert mountain preserves in the Phoenix area. We are one of the most unique cities in our country that have these kinds of, of preserve, desert preserves here. Uh, so we, we, we're here to continue to do that. And I just wanted to say thank you very much for, <laughs> Deborah, you supporting this, and to your staff, Claire, oh, my goodness, and to the director of the, of the parks, Erickson. Uh, they do great work in doing this. And I just wanted to point out um, that in the budget here, it says add two-part ranger positions and materials to support Phoenix CARES program in the city's urban parks and preserves. So, you know, to that, that's, they're adding more just so that we need that. There is a 60% increase of homeless in the valley here. And so, you know, and also I wanted to point out, you know, in the lobby here is our newsletter. Because what PMPC does is look at preserving these preserves, these mountain preserves, for the people here, for our veterans, for all, some of you might know about the Mission Continues group of veterans who do volunteer work to improve the parks and trail work and so forth like that. I'm a Vietnam vet also, so that's what those are, that's what these are for. So you can take a walk and be next to this beautiful earth, this desert. And as we call locally, I'm a desert rat, you know, I, I know these, <laughs> I love the desert. So I'm here to really support the, uh, the preserves and to say thank you very much for that. And that again, in the budget, two park rangers are going here to support care. And, uh, and just to have these preserves for us vet veterans, for us hikers, for the horse people, all of these, it's just great stuff. So, you know, thank you. That's why I just like to see this in the budget and there's good things, uh, good. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Next speaker is Max Soma Campana. <coughs> Right? Okay, I wasn't sure if that was an O or an A. <laughs> Some can. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, I wasn't planning on speaking this evening. I looked at the budget, and it's an incredible budget, so thank you so much for all your time. I had one thing um, in the library, a suggestion. I see that the Yucca, Century, Harmon, and Ocotillo branches are getting restored on their Sunday hours. Um, our local Acacia library down there <laughs> on uh, 7th Street south of Dunlap. Um, my son and I go um, a lot there. We love the library services. Um, we love the technology advances that the library has provided us. But on the physical nature of particularly the Acacia branch, um, it just it has, it has started to make us wonder about going back to Juniper or Choa, which is further away. We live here in Moon Valley. So I just wanted to recommend if there's anything that you guys can look at at the budget for Acacia. At least now, now it's closed on Sundays and Mondays, so just something to take a look at. Thank you. Thank you. Charles Weber. So my, uh, I'm Charles Weber. Um, I live at the point at Tapatio. And uh, thank you for being here and having this uh, opportunity to speak. Um, so I have more or less two questions, actually, more, uh, more to the point. Um, and it goes to, to what I've known and seen in the federal government, having worked in the federal government, and the, um, the appropriations or misappropriations occasionally um, that happens for projects. Um, so we often, it, almost every single municipality tends to put uh, fire and police in the general fund. And that oftentimes gets all kinds of organizations or sub-budgets get pulled off of that. And frequently, due to overruns, um, all of a sudden, we you, need no, to long, get a little closer to you no longer have enough funds for military and fire when, and, and a shortfall occurs. And then, then the uh, council people or our politicians will tell us, we need more funding because of police and fire. You don't want to, you know, compromise uh, police and fire, and they need the money. However, um, 
having worked in the federal government, I know that sometimes uh, for a base we'll get uh, funding. Uh, the um, lifestyle parts of the base get built first and the functional parts get built last. And oftentimes those critical parts are need to be have a separate budget themselves that cannot be bled off of by other parts of the government in order to uh, create a quality of life issue before necessities of critical infrastructure and the response times and um, to that aspect, you know, the I was the second question I had and is semi related is for the um, Latino Cultural Center. Now, I think all cultural centers are, are wonderful, they're great. I didn't know whether, you know, the Chinese Cultural Center receives money as well, or, you know, and that seems like a, a subgroup of our population that we know about. It's over, it's very well represented in this town. I don't know whether that's a critical part of where our funds need to go, um, where we all, Every part of our day in life is, is aware of the Latino presence in this community. Um, that's not to say we can't learn more about one another. However, there are lots of other people in our community that don't have cultural centers. And um, that doesn't necessarily need to be spent for any cultural center, perhaps. Um, but I do see the budget appropriations for the census. And I know that oftentimes um, I work in, in in the computer software industry, and uh, the estimation is over underestimated on the security and the um, the setup of infrastructure for, say, the census uh, appropriations that have been made for the 2020 for software. Thank you very much. I appreciate your, uh, your comments. Um, the census is very important to us. Um, every person that's counted brings money to the city of Phoenix, brings revenue for our important services like public safety and for arts, culture, for libraries, for our roads. So it's very important that we, we facilitate an accurate count in Phoenix. Um, and as far as your other comments, maybe we could just explain that the cultural center, is, it's just a study at this point, right? Right, there is no Latino Cultural Center in Phoenix, and uh, Latinos are probably close to 50% of the population of Phoenix. We have cultural Center, we have Japanese Friendship Gardens, and so there's been a, an effort at the city council and the community to celebrate the Latino heritage of Phoenix. This budget adds a position, one person, to do some work on identifying how to bring the study the councilman talked about to fruition in a building. It's, it's going to take private funding, the, the city will not be able to fund uh, the, the center and it's going to take bringing together private sector funding in order to make that happen. So this is a position to organize that effort. Thank you. And our last speaker, last but not least, John Dean. Thank you, Mr. Dean. Hello. Um, my name's John Dean, I'm a uh, fire captain. You guys, oh, oh. you guys can probably hear me, huh? No, you're no. Right. Okay. okay. All right. My name's John Dean, I'm a fire captain with the City of Phoenix. I've been here 21 years, currently assigned to Special Operations Unit, um, which is all your hazmat, mountain rescues. Um, been there about four months, but pretty much worked all over the city. And I live up north uh, in another, another little area, but you've heard, you know, sitting back tonight, everyone has needs. And I would certainly agree. And as uh, Steve mentioned before, for the last 10 years, we've, take, we've had budget cuts. In 2007, it started, 2009, and it's continued. And as the revenues have, have increased, one of the things is we need to have a plan of how we're going to increase staffing, whether it be on the fire side, whether it be on the police side. Steve rattled off some numbers before, and I worked with him, because we started looking at what, what the national numbers are. And as we said, fire engines have carry water. Fire tr uh, ladder trucks support operations and keep our guys safe. We are, when we look at the staffing, we are, the national number should be every, for every two engines, you should have a, two to three engines, you should have a ladder, we're at 4.5. That is, is that staffing issues. Our last company we put in place was in 2009, downtown as an infill. 
we have not added any equipment. We had, we had equipment that was supposed to be in uh, stations built on bonds. Those went away during the tough times. It, we need to have a plan of how we're going to increase staffing, whether it be in the fire side, whether it be in the police side. I run the, the numbers as far as where we are when it comes to um, national standards. And as Steve said, we have six trucks that meet the national standard for getting there in that, in that five minute time, four to five minute time frame. We have ladder trucks, so it's only 12% of the time. And those are downtown companies. We've expanded greatly since you know, 2007. We've not kept up, kept up as far as when it came to staffing, uh, equipment. And you see that on the police side, they're running short squads, we're running short. We're 50,000 more calls, and it's not gonna stop. We have continuous growth in this area. And as Marshall mentioned before, this is a very busy area. So, is, so are the other areas that surround it. So when those five companies are running three and 4,000 calls, we're running just as many in the companies around us. When you get up north, I can tell you right now, because I live up there, I work up there, there's times there are no ambulances available. There are times, that I've had a time where there's 33, which is at uh, 25th Avenue Cactus, next truck was Dynamite and Cave Creek from, from uh, Scottsdale to Glendale. So we have this issue here we have to have a plan. We have to have a plan of how we're going to increase staffing, uh, whether it be on fire and the police, but we also need to have a plan of how we're going to continue to grow all the needs that, that you folks talked about tonight. So um, I sit on several committees with the fire department. I can tell you it's not just staffing, it's equipment, it's resources. We are going to be challenged. We're going to be here next year with, with contracts. We're going to be here continuously having the same discussion about not having enough funding to do the things that we need to, to keep you safe and to have the city that we live in protected properly. So thank you for your time tonight. Um, like I said, I thank you, Ed, and, and thank, so thank you. Thank you. So that's the end of our um, comment cards. I do want to let you know, and it really is important that you, you got what you say matters. And I'm going to use Craig. Last year, he came to every one of the budget hearings practically and spoke up for CAST. And in the end, we ended up giving some additional funds. Probably not as much as you wanted, but we did, I know, we did find some funds for him. So what you say really does make a difference to the council. We have a host of other meetings coming up tomorrow night. Councilman Waring and I are having a joint meeting together at Paradise Valley Community College. I'm also having a hearing Wednesday morning at Shadow Mountain Senior Center. And then I have another meeting on Thursday with counts, uh, the councilman from District 5 will be at Sunny Slope. And there's a whole host of other meetings, so hopefully you'll get out and speak your mind so that the council can hear what you're concerned about. Thanks again for coming here. I really appreciate all your time, your effort. Thank you so much. Very valuable.